Yeah, hi, and welcome to this session. Um, this is my colleague Konstantin. Uh, my name is Maximilian. Um, we both work for TNG Technology Consulting, uh, which is Munich based um, and uh, focused on high end IT consulting. We are currently um, especially focused on distributed systems, in particular real time processing. We both work for a for Telefonica Germany, where um, we have built a platform that's processing billions of events a day, and we are proud to say that we are running Flink in production since uh, the beginning of last year. What is this talk going to be about? Uh, as you have already heard from the title, um, it's about variable state. Um, so in the first part, we want to talk a little bit about what that is, give you a bit of motivation. Um, secondly, we want to share with you a use case um, uh, in this context and uh, requirements of this use case. We build a prototype um, for a billing system. And in the third and uh, well, largest part of the talk, we are going to take this prototype um, through different failure scenarios and show you how it behaves. Is the mic somewhat off? <laughs> it's working. Okay. Can I continue? Yeah. yeah, okay. So let's get started. Queryable state. It's, uh, as I've already told you, um, it's a feature that was introduced uh, in Flink 1.2. Um, and I want to give, uh, firstly, a quick uh, motivation about that. Um, so in the next few slides, um, let's together consider a system with two somewhat competing um, requirements. On the one hand, um, you need the system to be able to guarantee correctness, but then on the other hand, you want to be able to um, generate low latency insights. So, for example, uh, think of uh, some kind of a web shop um, where for each user you want to know exactly how many clicks he had um, in a day, and you want this number to be exact. But then you also uh, you also need, um, let's say, every minute um, the average clicks across users or something like that. So uh, traditionally, what people have used in order to solve problems like this um, is a dual approach known as the lambda architecture. I'm sure many of you will know this. Um, so here you have two dual layers: a speed layer um, with a stream processor, for example, Storm. Um, but this, this uh, delivers low latency uh, results, but can't really be trusted correctness-wise. And then you have a batch layer running MapReduce jobs uh, once a day um, that, that really computes uh, correct results to be trusted, right? Um, and so one could see some, some problems with this kind of architecture. You have these separate systems that you need to develop for in different frameworks. Um, you have to operate the system separately. Um, so modern uh, stream processes, oh, yeah, it's super off. <laughs> okay, is that better? That's completely off. <laughs> Do you want to talk to me? <laughs> yeah, I think you can hear me anyways, no? Okay, um, yeah. So where was I? Modern stream processes like Apache Flink um, that are fault tolerant um, and resilient against failures enable us to do away with this batch layer. So in, in Flink, you could just aggregate um, this, this minute-wise aggregations uh, I talked about um, and put it into a key value store, but Flink can guarantee also under failures um, that the results will be correct at the end of the day. So this is, this is a step forward, but still, um, one has this external key value store, for example, Redis or whatever, um, that needs to be operates, uh, operated, that needs to be scaled independently of your processing. And your stream processor, in order to give these strong guarantees, already has to be able to keep track of the state internally. So why don't we just go directly to the stream processor? And that is what queryable state does. So if you now want to see what, what is the current average over the last minute uh, of clicks, you just ask the stream processor. That's the idea about queryable state. I hope uh, I 
could give you some motivation, uh, even though there were technical problems. But now Konstantin is going to talk about how it's implemented in Flink. Right. Good afternoon from myself as well. Um, so I'm guessing most of you know what Apache Flink is. Just to, just to recap um, the, the different components there are. Um, you have the job manager, which is basically the master node, so to say, which does all the coordination between the different task managers, but it doesn't do any of the work itself and doesn't hold any state. And then there, there you have a lot of You have a lot of task managers, or multiple task managers, which actually do the processing, which are the workers. And in the case of querable state, you also have the querable state client, which is just some process outside of the cluster. I think right now it's only possible with the Java process, but or only Java client is feasible, but um, it's separated from everything else. Okay, let's look a little bit into more detail how this thing works for querable state. So, um, as I said, the state is, so we'll focus on the green um, boxes right now. So, the querable state, as I said, is only, or well, the state is only located in the task managers. So, for the querable state client to retrieve the state, it goes to the task manager directly. So the querable state client, which is in the client, go, uh, the key value state client goes to the key value state server of the task managers. The most frequently used sort of state in Flink is keyed state. So depending on your key, the state is distributed about, uh, among multiple task managers. So if you now think of the key as the su subscriber, then for different subscribers, the key is located on different task managers. Now the key values the querable state client needs to know which task manager to go to for a particular, for a particular subscriber. So, um, since the task manager or since it has no way to know, it has this key value state location lookup service, which exactly does that. It asks the job manager where does subscriber A has its state, and then it goes directly for the task manager for the actual data. These are basically the purple uh, boxes. So how does the job manager know where each state is located on the task managers? That's just um, through the usual ACAR-based um, notification services between the task manager and the job manager. It's just a different ACAR, um, different ACAR message that the task manager send to the job manager, same way as, for example, I finished processing this task or I'm um, I'm currently opening this operator. Um, so then the only thing the queryable state client needs to know is the job manager. And if you have a high availability setup, there are multiple job managers. So it has to know the active job manager um, because only this job manager um, gets all the updates. Um, and for this, there's the leader retrieval service. It's now also wrapped into a high availability service, I think. But uh, basically, it's this re leader retrieval service, which is called every time there's a job manager failover. So what you should take away from this slide is basically that querable state is always, or usually it's only a communication between this client and the task managers. And the job managers only ask once, where does this key live? And then this is cached because um, so that's important, basically, to understand s the behavior and some of the failure scenarios we will see in the demo when we kill task managers, when we kill job managers. Okay. Are there any questions so far? All right. So um, just a quick introduction of our use case. Um, we called it querable billing, and it's basically a prototypical use case which we have condensed from um, mainly one project we've, we've seen at our client, not our own pro project, but a, um, yeah, adjacent project, so to say, um, which was solved completely differently, but then we heard about querable state in Flink, and we're like, okay, most of that we could have done with Flink, and we just wanted to try out how, how could one ha have solved that, um, that for the background. So what were the requirements? Um, basically, you have a telecommunication network, and this telecommunication network generates a couple of events. 
a lot of events usually, um, and these events need to be built. So if there's a call, if there's a text message, data usage, pack, packs which are booked, like daily flat rates and this kind of stuff. And all these events are collected from um, the network components um, and they go into the system and the main purpose of the system is to aggregate them over the months, aggregate the usage, and then forward this information to the downstream system, which in our case we said is the invoicing system, which is able to send mail, in, mail invoices to customers. Besides this main use case, we also have a side use case, which um, is on the bottom. Um, we also want our clients to uh, give our clients the opportunity to query their current usage in the month via web application. Um, and you can probably already guess where queryable state um, is coming in here. Um, the one at the bo uh, top is very similar, or from a technical point of view, very similar um, requirement. Probably once management has heard that you can do this kind of stuff, they want some dashboards to do some real-time monitoring, monitoring on marketing campaigns and so on. Maybe it's split by different usage scenarios, pack book, uh, packages which are booked, and so on and so on. Um, so these are basically the functional requirements, but there are also some, some quality goals. Um, first of all, there is correctness. We're dealing with invoices here. If you um, send a, out a lot of invoices with which overcount events and stuff like that, you will have a lot of, um, a lot of traffic in your user uh, desk and um, yeah, lose money this way. The other way around, you lose money directly by uh, charging people um, too few. Um, so that's correctness. That's the number one criterion. Um, then you also have robustness. If, if we're dealing with a, with a distributed system here, you always have partial faults. Task managers go down, job managers go down. Um, maybe the, the invoicing system goes down. Um, so it needs to be robust to these kind of failures, but it also needs to be robust to um, out-of-order data, to um, late events, especially if the events are coming from such a heterogeneous um, network as a telecommunication network, where also always some core sites can have a lag of half an hour or the events just don't, are not forwarded to, to this data center anymore. Availability is not that much of an issue if you only want to write invoices. I mean. It only has to be available at the end of the month, basically. Um, but once you want to also um, enable the customers to query their live usage, uh, you want the system to be up and running most of the time, at least. Um, scalability is not a core requirement here. It, of course, it's nice if it's elastic, because then you can scale it down during the night where there are much less events. Um, but yeah, we will only, basically, we won't deal with it here. <laughs> Okay, um, now let's, let's talk about the architecture and uh, Max will do that. Sure, so as far as the technology stack is concerned that we chose to use for this prototype, um, so here's a basic sketch of that. So on, on the left-hand side, you have this antenna which signalizes, which, which is for, stands for a data generator um, that we use uh, to well, generate events that then are to be built uh, somehow. Um, and this, this data generator has um, some amount of determinism uh, inside it, but also some amount of randomness. We are going to go into more detail on that later. Um, then those events are firstly written to, to Kafka, which is a distributed message, uh, message broker, message queue, if you haven't heard of that, um, from where um, our main component reads in those events, which is a flink job. Um, with a little squirrel over there. And um, then the invoices are written to a distributed file system. Um, and the idea is that from this distributed file system, uh, the, another adjacent system that then sends out mails, uh, mail uh, with the bills to our customers uh, could, could fetch um, those final bills. And uh, now, now two remarks, uh, particularly interesting for people who are already somewhat familiar with Flink. Um, first, notice that um, Th this configuration, uh, reading from Kafka and writing to a distributed file system, is one where exactly once is possible, right? Because in the case of failures, you can restore 
uh, from a checkpoint, um, and then you can, on the one hand, rewind your Kafka source and also truncate the file system. And then you can start reprocessing without duplicating any events, right? Um, and then secondly, um, well, minor point, but this, this, um, that, that the fact that we are using a distributed file system, well, we chose that um, for this prototype, but one could have as well this invoicing system, um, yeah, being implemented as a service that accepts uh, idempotent HTTP request, yeah. And, and it would work just exactly the same. So that was the horizontal lane of, of uh, invoice creation. Now for the, um, for the part that's actually concerned uh, with queryable state. Um, from our perspective, the queryable state client is um, still a little, well, let's say, rough around the edges. You probably wouldn't want to put, uh, put it directly in your front end. So what we did is uh, wrap it in a Spring Boot application, um, and then the JavaScript front end can fetch its data from there. Um, and also here on the right-hand side, um, you could build a dashboard in tools like Grafana, um, but we, w we aren't going to go into more detail here because it's functionally just the same. Um, so rather, let's uh, zoom in on the Flink job. Um, uh, the, the job graph, uh, for those already familiar with, with pictures like this, this is what a Flink job graph looks like. It isn't super spectacular, right? Um, so on the left-hand side, uh, the events from Kafka are, are read in, uh, timestamps are assigned, watermarks are emitted, and so on. And then we, we want to aggregate um, uh, a customer's usage for the month. Um, so we do 30-day time windows um, and fold all these events up, um, basically sum up the, the billable amounts, um, and then write out using bucketing sync, which is Flink's standard way of writing to a distributed file system. And then what one actually would like to do in an ideal world is make this state um, in those windows queryable directly. Unfortunately, right now, that's not possible. Um, so just as a quick technical aside, how, how did we do this? Um, we basically duplicated um, the whole logic with the fold function um, and trigger the windows on each event that comes in. And then in the window function that, that is applied on each event, um, this state can be made queryable. So this is, this is the second blob that you see on the right-hand side of the graph, and the third plot is basically the same, but not keyed by customer, but uh, keyed by event type. So how many calls were there in this month, how many uh, messages that are to be built, how many yeah, bookings or flat rates or whatever. Yeah. Now we are going to go into the most interesting part of the talk. Yes, our demo. Um, so we basically set up the whole system uh, in a, in a Docker setup. Um, so let's just to, to give you a rough idea how it's, um, how it's set up, let's see what containers there are. And if there are any questions during the demo or anything looks suspicious or dubious, please ask right away. Um, can, can people from the back read, read this? Or, yeah? Okay. Okay. So as you can see, we have, I think, 10 uh, containers. Um, there are four containers which are just the Flink cluster, two job managers, and two task managers. Um, so that we can kill one of them and it's still somehow working. Um, then there's a one Kafka broker, which makes up the whole Kafka cluster, and Zookeeper at the bottom, uh, which supports Kafka and also the job manager high availability of Flink. And then there we have four containers, which are basically the queryable billing, um, the data generator, which just generates these data all the time, uh, these events and puts them into Kafka. Then there is the job itself, the QB job, which is just the client which submitted the job to the cluster and doesn't do anything afterwards. Um, there's the QB server, which is this small Spring Boot application, and the front end is also a, a separate container which just serf serves statically the, the content for the um, web application. Okay. Um, so let's first recap the requirements, and we'll basically um, go through them and check them during the demo. Um, so we have the functional requirements, which are, on the one hand, correct invoices, on the other hand, live updates, um, queryable via this web UI. Um, then we have the non-functional well, quality goals. <laughs> um, 
which is correctness, availability. We won't look at scalability because we only have nine customers in this demo, so we can't say anything about scalability in terms of keys. Um, and, well, it's on only one laptop, so, yeah. Um, robustness, on the other hand, we will look at uh, late arriving events out of orderness. Uh, we'll look at task manager and job manager failures, and also um, we'll look at uh, failures of the downstream system. So, is this basically the, the billing system, uh, the invoicing system. Okay, let's start with just invoice generation. So to so what you can see here is, first of all, the Flink UI up there. The job is running for 24 minutes now, and um, data is being generated. So let's, let's have a look at the stream of data which goes into, can we, uh, yeah. Nice. Um, so, is that readable from the back? Yeah? Okay. So, um, basically, the events just have a timestamp. They have uh, a name, Emma, Sophia, Noah, and so on. There's some euro amount and a type, package, message, and so on. And what this data generator basically does is it um, generates random amounts, but they always add up to the same value for each customer for each month. So it's for Emma, for example, it's always 100 euros uh, at the end of the month, if everything went well. So this is our way now in this demo to, um, to see if we lost any elements or if we overcounted. If at the end of the month it's always a, an even amount for each customer, then that, that looks good. So we said we are writing to a distributed file system. For this Docker setup, you might have noticed we didn't set up anything like HDFS or something like that. Um, so what we are just did is we mounted a Docker volume to all the containers or to the Flink containers, and we use this Docker volume as kind of a mock distributed file system. It behaves surprisingly similar in some cases. <laughs> yeah, actually there are some uh, problems, but. So here we have then one folder for each month, and if we, if we look into it, um, it just gives you the month, the um, subscriber, um, the user, and then the sum. So as you can see, it's all even amounts, um, but there is actually one amount which is not even, which is William in March. Uh, 89, we started at, at the epoch in 1970. So let's see how far we get. It's about 30 seconds per month, um, the event time progress uh, in this demo. Um, so William had 249.94, but then there was a late arriving event, so the window got fired again. If you're familiar with Flink's um, way of dealing with lateness, so you, a window always fires uh, when the checkpoint, for when the watermark for this um, time passes, but then you can also um, say, I want to keep the state around for an, some more time, which is called allowed lateness, and if another event comes after that, it will fire again. And that's what you see now here in, ca uh, in case of Sophia, when there was one event, event missing, and the window got already fired, but then there was an update afterwards with late and arriving events. So if we go back to our requirements, Invoice generation works. Um, I mean, it's pretty basic, but it works. Um, correctness works at least in the case where everything goes right, which is easy. And um, robustness, um, late events work. Uh, out of orderness also, work, uh, also works. So this event stream, we didn't see it, but the event stream is pretty out of order, actually. Um, and there are some late events as well. Um, these we saw. So let's also have a look at the live updates now. So um, as we said, this Spring Boot application basically exposes um, or wraps the queryable state client. So we can do a, we can just curl this uh, service. And um, here, for example, we get the current, um, we, um, basically um, going to cu uh, customers Emma and we get the current amount. And this amount increases, increases, and at, at some point it's at 100, and then it starts for the next month again. Um, so this this also works, um, but to ah, we can also have a look at at the type. Um, 
yeah, you can also query f for the type call, for the type text or message, I think. Yeah. But um, that's not that convenient uh, for the demo now because we want to see how does it behave if we kill a task manager, for example. So um, we basically just have this very small <laughs> front end which every two seconds queries this um, Spring Boot application and shows the current um, the current um, uh, usage of this customer. Um, as long as this um, timestamp is, is green, it means that it reached the service and the service was able to query the Flink cluster. Um, so yeah, right now it's running. Um, so I think we can go back to the requirements and check live updates and now start with the more interesting stuff. Um, killing the, the components. So let's start with the task manager. So we were just going to kill one of the task managers. So um, And since this cluster is very poorly provisioned, <laughs> this will render the job um, yeah, not restartable because we don't have enough slots. Of course, in any setup, you wouldn't want to do that. But uh, here, it gives us a little bit more control when the job starts again. Um, for those of you who paid attention, you saw that um, Isa was live a little bit longer than uh, Emma. That was because we killed the task manager where the state of Emma resided. And the other task manager, that's the, the beauty of distributed system, it didn't know that the other task manager was, um, was killed and kept running the job and was still able to serve the request by the queryable state client. And only when the job manager realized, okay, this task manager has gone, I need to Re, um, basically restart the job, uh, job from a checkpoint, it killed the job on the other task manager and ESA wasn't able to um, serve these requests or the task manager wasn't able to uh, serve the requests for ESA as well. So now let's let's restart the task manager so, so that... Should we look at the invoices? Yeah, uh, we can look at the invoices, yes. So um, we are in... The last, last invoice we got were from November 1983. Uh, uh, and if you look at the current um, date in the pro, um, current date in the log, uh, we have 90, uh, we're February uh, 84. So what we would expect is that it basically grinds through the Kafka log and outputs all the invoices um, correctly. So uh, let's restart the task manager and see if the job comes up again. Trying again, and yeah, queryable state is also um, ac uh, accessible any, uh, again. Um, it basically you can already see uh, 1984, four, um, April 1984. So it also alri already went through uh, the backlog. So um, let's have a look at the invoices. All even amounts, I think. Um, so that looks pretty good, and we're also up to date. Um, so we have events from April and the last um, invoice we have are from March. So that looks good. Okay, um, so task manager failure, it seems to work. Um, availability is, is compromised though. So as long as the job is not running, the queryable state is also not ex uh, accessible. But keep in mind that normally the job would be restarted pretty much in instantaneously as long as there are not uh, enough task slots. And Usually, your cluster would be provisioned in a way that you can cope with a couple of task uh, manager failures and the job can be restarted um, immediately. But there is a small downtime um, in um, any case. Okay, let's look at job manager failure. <laughs> so, um, which job manager are we currently running on? Two. Job manager two, okay. Yeah, then we kill job manager two and um, see what happens. So again, the job manager is, is dead, but queryable state still works because it doesn't communicate with the job manager once it's running. So um, only when the timeout of the leader election service basically uh, kicks in and realizes, okay, there is no job manager anymore, the task managers will be killed 
by the new job manager and then the querible state will not be accessible anymore. So again, the same like, distributed system uh, at, yeah, at its best. <laughs> That's irony, by the way. Um, okay, um, now we can have a look at job manager one, I think. Yeah. So j new job manager is here, but it hasn't recovered the job yet. It will eventually. And now the querible state client connects to the new job manager and uh, basically runs through the, all the events from the last checkpoint. Um, we can also have a look at the uh, invoices again. If there are any uneven numbers. There is one uneven number, but there's another update afterwards, which uh, brings it up to 80 again. Same here for Emma. Yeah. Looks good. So. Correctness also uh, in case of job manager failures. Um, availability again is a little bit compromised during the switch over, but that's also a very short amount of time. Okay, last but not least, failure of a downstream system. So what does downstream system mean in our case? Um, we're writing to the, to the file system, so our downstream system is basically the file system. Um, if we were writing or if we would do idempotent calls to uh, some REST API, it would be the, in this um, service. Um, the behavior is pretty much the same. Um, so what, what would we want to, ha to happen? Since in these architectures, um, basically Kafka is always the, the fallback layer, um, we would actually want the processing to stop and the events being, yeah, saved in Kafka, persisted in Kafka, and once the downstream system is available again, we want to run through the backlog and send all the events to the downstream system. So what we are doing here now is, um, as I said, our distributed file system is this, um, this Docker volume, um, which is called um, invoices, I think, the, or the folder is called invoices, and we'll just move it to invoices archive and see what, happened, uh, what happens. So nothing happens because the month is not over yet, so it doesn't try to write out. That's why everything is going well right now. And at some point, it will fail. We can already look what the invoice archive of the last month is. Now it tried to write out and uh, the job failed and it is now basically stuck in this st uh, restarting um, restarting failing loop because now it, when it starts up, I think it checks whether the file system is available and it's not available in this case. Um, if it wouldn't do the check, it would fail directly in any case because it then goes through all the events in Kafka and uh, is then stuck when writing out again. So it's running again it's, uh, and so on. Um, and during the whole time, the queryable state um, Client has, has no way of retrieving the current um, current usage of the customers. Okay, let's recreate the directory to to end it. Okay, now it's successfully restarted and again goes through the Kafka log. Yeah, let's. Uh, what was last month? It was November '84. So the last one month which we moved um, and now it starts with December and um, all even amounts so again no duplication and no um, and no uh, lost messages so again it, correctness is not or correctness is fine in these uh, cases the invoices are correct and complete um, but availability is pretty much compromised um, it's basically you, you couple your current state of your compu computation to your computation. So um, you don't have any, any fallback right now. If you, if you st stopped summing up, you don't have access to your current sum, which is a lot different as if you were writing the sum to Redis, for example, and were just updating there. Then at least if the Flink cluster goes down, you still have the last, um, 
yeah, your last uh, sum in, in Redis. Okay, um, so let's, um, I, I already started a little bit, let's look at some of the, the um, limitations um, we have uh, with querable state right now. So first of all, some of you might have noticed the way we build the queryable state now or and the way um, we use the queryable, uh, queryable state now is that we have one state per key, but it's not scoped to the window. Um, so it's, uh, for, some, uh, for those of you who are more familiar with Flink, uh, it's basically only keyed, but the namespace is always the, the void main, na main uh, namespace. Um, so um, there's no way um, to query the the sum for two months at the same time for one customer. It's always just the latest, the month of the latest event. Um, but this will, they, we saw that they, ch they changed it with 1.3, but there wasn't anything done with queryable state in 1.3, so I think it was all postponed to 1.4, but it's a pretty small fix, so, or pretty small additional feature. Um, and I, I guess they will do it in 1.4. Um, the client API, Max already said it, um, it's pretty, Cumbersome right now, so basically you need the, your Flink configuration. You need to need to do all the Flink type serialization stuff, uh, which is not not really com convenient. So you, you would want it to be basically a REST call, I think, um, because then you can really use different clients and not just uh, a Java or Scala client where you can basically use these classes. Um, state size, of course, is also a limitation. So if your if your job <laughs> I don't know who, who, who was in, in Stefan's uh, talk uh, last session, but basically, uh, as long as um, as long as you have, um, if you don't have the throughput requirements that you cannot use RocksDB, then you have no limit here. But there might be a performance penalty at some point for queryable state. Um, but if you need to use a memory, memory uh, state backend for performance reasons, then um, your state size cannot be larger than your main memory. And last, I already touched upon it, um, av availability in case of job failures is, is basically always uh, a problem um, if, if your job doesn't come up immediately. I mean, you can do caching and all, all this stuff, so in a lot of cases it should work, but it's definitely, you definitely couple your results to your ongoing computation, which is something you should think about. Okay. That's basically it. You can check out the code in the slides on GitHub. Um, play around with it yourself a little bit. And um, yeah, we're happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Max and Konstantin. <laughs> Max is uh, the man in the dark. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's Konstantin, actually. Oh, sorry, Konstantin. <laughs> um, so, any questions? <laughs> Yeah, so could you maybe elaborate a little bit on the limitations you said with the state size? Because uh, I'm interested, you said you had a, your window was basically 30 days. So I would imagine there would be a very large amount of data in the window. And also, did you have maybe some problems with uh, the slide of the window? Because we ran into some problems with having a window of uh, uh, 24 hours, but had to be sl sl uh, had to slide by one minute. So you had a lot of copies of the same objects in the data, and then we had a lot of garbage collection issues, blah, blah, blah. So I don't know, maybe just some of your experiences with these types of issues. Yeah. So in, in this case, there weren't any, any issues because it's only nine keys. Um, and also, it, even for, for a lot of customers, so think about I don't know, 40 million or something like that, uh, it still shouldn't be too much data because um, there's always a fault operator, as, or in this case, there, it's just one number. So it shouldn't be in the gigabytes, let's say, the state, even for, for 40 million. Um, yeah, object overhead and so on. But um, yeah, um, we didn't, we don't have any sliding windows here. Um, I think I, I saw the, the mailing list thread on, uh, on these, yeah, on the, um, yeah, many slides. Um, yeah, it's definitely a limitation, <laughs> but I don't have any solution on it. I, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's basically how the how Windows work in Flink right now, that if you assign it to multiple windows, then it always duplicates the state. Um, and that's especially a problem if you don't have a fault or reduce function in, um, for pre-aggregation of the window state. Um, 
There is, I think, a talk from 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 Stefan as well, um, who is talking a little bit more about um, how Curl with state scales in terms of number of keys and um, state size. So if if you're interested or if anyone is interesting, especially into how Curl with state scales. Um, then you should check out check out this this talk. I don't know the name, but you'll probably find it if if you look for the stream processor as a database, St Stefan Evan or something like that. Uh, yeah. Um, so I may not be super familiar with uh, Flink, but um, as far as the, the queryability of this data set, uh, how flexible is it, like in terms of aggregate, aggregation or um, the sort of the time window, um, uh, in terms of I guess the step sizes? It may be a similar question as what someone just asked, but um, I'm assuming because it's a key value kind of a store, uh, a lot of the Querying essentially is give me everything for this key for this time period and then just do all the aggregation in code essentially. Is that is that a fair way of? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's know? a good question. So basically, at at runtime or at query time, it's not flexible at all. Uh, so the way it's implemented right now, you uh, the whole aggregation and and the time periods has to be um, yeah has to be hard coded. Uh, or Made configurable or whatever, but you you can't decide at uh, at query time. Now I want to do this kind of aggregation. Um, you you could have, could of course just fetch the raw data and then aggregate in, in some fashion, but yeah, that's how it works. But the the object is basically can be any any Java object which is state. Um, so it's just need to be able to to serialize it and deserialize it. Um, and the same serialization, deserialization penalties apply, which apply to, to all the state and in, in Okay, then, uh, thank you very much for this talk. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks again.